Welcome to this video where we are looking at the prediction of house prices. So here what you will see is uh, a GitHub page. Um, the link is github.com slash web artifacts slash aims minus housing. And this is all the code and all the files, the data files that you need to follow um, what I'm about to present to you. And again, uh, this is a presentation uh, of using some um, simple machine learning algorithms to predict house prices. So first, if you go to this link, what you see here is a couple of um, files and one folder. Up here, you see a data folder. If you click on that, we see that there are a couple of CSV files in it and also some other files that contain uh, the data. And um, this is it. And then we have uh, four files that start with the numbers one, two, three, and four. These are so-called Jupyter Notebooks. And these are the data formats in which we present the analysis of this case study. And then you have some other files. So um, regarding uh, this uh, case study, this is actually based on a scientific paper. And there is a paper.pdf file also included. And uh, what you can do is you can click on it and you can open a um, an uh, article from the Journal of Statistics Education and uh, where they basically talk about everything um, that we are also uh, looking at. And um, we will at some points uh, contrast what we find to this paper. So um, again, um, you don't have to uh, look at this to understand um, the video, but uh, if you want to dig a little bit deeper, then maybe it's worthwhile to read it. And also there is a map.pdf file uh, which shows you a map of the city of Ames in Iowa, the United States. This is where the data set is taken from. And um, this is basically showing you all the different neighborhoods. We see there are many different neighborhoods here in different colors. And uh, all the houses are from these neighborhoods. And as we shall see, um, the neighborhood is also um, a, you know, a, an important feature of uh, where, to, uh, where the, the price is going to be, if it's a high price or not so high price. So what do you need uh, to, to replicate uh, what you're about to see here? Well, first of all, you need uh, a working installation of Python. Um, I'm using Python 3.7 here. So uh, the easiest way for a beginner to get this is to go to anaconda.com. And uh, Anaconda is a private company that uh, offers commercial products around uh, the Python software, but also uh, has some open source distribution here, which is called the individual edition. So you click on that um, and then scroll down. You can download it. And the nice thing about here, we have the installers all for Windows, Mac OS and Linux. So it should work on uh, whatever system you have. And uh, the good thing about Anaconda is it not only ships you uh, the current version of Python, but also many um, so-called scientific um, libraries, for example, Jupyter, which we will need in this um, case study, but also NumPy and sklearn. sklearn is the default machine learning library in Python. Pandas, uh, which stands for panel data, um, is the default um, library for dealing with data, for, which is basically the Excel replacement, if you, if you will. And uh, there are some other libraries we don't really need, um, but um, it basically ships with everything you would need in a typical data science project. So if you don't use Python from anaconda.com, your alternative would be to go to python.org and download a pure version of Python, but then you would have to install um, Jupyter and all the other um, third-party libraries on your own. So I think for a beginner, it's easier to um, just download Anaconda. And then also, as I said, um, this is all built in Python. If you are missing um, some basics in Python, um, I also am the author of some uh, Python introduction materials, which you will find at a similar URL. It's github.com slash web artifacts uh, slash intro to Python. And you have files um, containing an entire semester course on Python and um, exercises as well. And most importantly, um, you have for every chapter and a link to a YouTube video. Um, so uh, you could uh, basically review the basics of Python if you um, still miss some of the uh, background here. And uh, for further background of how to make this project work, there is also another um, page, um, a help page called jupyterlab.readthedocs.io here. And uh, JupyterLab is the environment in which we will program Python. So uh, if you have uh, any troubles installing this or any troubles to uh, understand what are the keyboard shortcuts that you may want to use and what else you can do with it, 
um, the, this would be the best uh, resource to look this up. And then there's one more resource, which is the original Kaggle competition. So Kaggle is a company that uh, where you know many other companies and organizations can upload data sets and uh, make them available for free for individuals around the world uh, that can then participate in so-called um, competitions and try to solve some data-driven problem. And the Ames uh, pricing house prices data set is actually also distributed on Kaggle, even though uh, it's also available without Kaggle. So Kaggle is just uh, the competition here. But um, if after this um, video you are still interested in learning more about this project, um, what you will see here is um, many uh, tutorials around this data set, but also um, the solutions of other uh, groups around the uh, globe that worked on this uh, case study. So if you are uh, not sure if you have the best solution or what else uh, could be done uh, in terms of math and statistics, uh, can take a look uh, here at the Kaggle competition page. And uh, if I close this now, uh, here now in my web browser, we see localhost 8888. And this is uh, the Jupyter Lab environment running in my uh, local uh, Chromium browser here. Um, if you cannot install that for whatever reason, if you go down uh, on the GitHub repository, you have links to the four, um, to the four notebooks as well to a service called MyBinder. And MyBinder is an interactive service which um, allows you to open a notebook um, in a web browser without installing anything. So um, if everything fails, you can always go back and uh, try to follow the analysis here. However, um, you have to know that um, this is um, you know, a temporary environment in the cloud. So it is uh, probably better to install Jupyter and Python and everything, as I already said, on your local machine. Um, this is in particular better um, if you want to use your computer's um, you know, uh, calculating power, because my binder in the free version does not have uh, so much um, computing power available. Okay, so um, let's go to Jupyter Lab. So I assume that somehow you will find a way to open the project in uh, Jupyter Lab. So the easiest one way to download the materials, by the way, would be to click on the green button here where it says clone and say download a zip. This is how you get all the files that I have here uh, as a zip file. But if you're familiar with the so-called git tool, you could also uh, git clone it. This is why this button is called clone. But I assume that somehow uh, you know, have knowledge on this already. So I'm not talking about this here. Uh, again, the easy solution is just download a zip and unpack the zip. This should make it work. And then um, when you open localhost uh, here on your, um, on your machine, um, this opens an instance of the JupyterLab environment. And what you see here is on the left-hand side, um, all the files that you just downloaded from GitHub. And um, then you see this uh, launcher here. So what the launcher is, if for example, we click on the notebook on Python 3, we get a new JupyterLab notebook where we can just enter in, the, in these code cells here, any Python code. So for example, one plus one. And if I execute this, I get back two. So I can basically create new uh, code files here uh, in this environment and execute them. However, for this presentation, I prepared uh, the four notebooks already. And um, so we will use them to go over the case study. So we start with notebook number one uh, called data cleaning. And uh, whenever you open a notebook from someone else and you start to do an analysis uh, to, or to replicate an analysis on your local machine, um, one um, good practice is to click on kernel and say restart kernel and clear all outputs. This will basically get rid of all the output that may have been there before because the person that prepared the notebook saved the file with the output. But now as we uh, run the code ourselves, we don't want there to be any output. And uh, because of that, I just cleared it. And this makes sure that there is nothing uh, left from previous runs. So um, again, these notebooks that I prepared for you, um, they have lots of text in them. So um, they are optimized also for reading, uh, for reading through the materials. Um, I will go over uh, the, um, the notebooks rather quickly. So uh, don't uh, be afraid that you cannot read everything here as I go over it, that is not the intention. The intention is that uh, if you want to dig deeper into a specific area of a notebook, then there is lots of text and documentation that helps you to dig deeper. But uh, we will, uh, in this video, only do a high-level overview um, on how 
to do data science in the context of house prices. So what I do in this notebook here in the beginning is what I call housekeeping. So um, we import um, some libraries, for example, NumPy, Pandas, and so on, uh, to make them available uh, within this Jupyter notebook here. And then uh, in the next code cell, I say from utils import, and what utils is, this is not the library that you install, but this is rather a file, a .py file. So here in the folder, you see there is a file called utils.py. And if you click on that, and then what we what we see is um, a text file opens and this has lots of python code in it and what i did is um, i put all the code that is not so relevant to be looked at in a notebook um, and also a code that is to be reused across several notebooks uh, i put it uh, in this file and uh, this is basically um, well, how a raw python would look like if it's not done in a Jupyter notebook uh, environment and uh, from this notebook uh, we will import uh, some helper functions and some helper uh, variables uh, to make the notebooks um, easier to follow. So whenever you don't find any code uh, or the code for some, something you don't understand, most likely it's going to be in this utils.py file here. Okay, so let's delete this temporary file as well. And let's continue here in the notebook. So I again, I import all these helper stuff here. And uh, then uh, further in the housekeeping, um, I uh, say pandas uh, should um, show me 100 columns. So by default, pandas will not show you so many columns. And uh, we set this to 100 because the data set uh, contains um, a lot of data, a lot of columns, I have to say. So um, at first, what we do here is um, we go ahead and here's some code that uh, loads the data file and uh, this is built such that um, when the data file, the CSV file is not in the project already, then it goes to uh, the original web page and uh, which is here at aimstat.org, which is the official page where the data is from and downloads an Excel file and prepares it, but then also temporarily stores it in your folder so that you don't have to go to this uh, URL all the time and uh, you know load the data again and again. So we call this caching. So uh, the data is temporarily saved in the data folder as well. And uh, it was there to begin with because I put it in the repo so that um, uh, you don't have to, so if, if you don't have a fast internet connection or whatever, then you already have the data here. And then we do some, uh, we run some code that basically puts all the data into what we call a pandas data frame. So a data frame in, in Python, in pandas, in the library pandas, is um, a special data type, which uh, you can compare to Excel. So this is basically uh, how you would model Excel-like data in, in Python. And then um, what we do here is we look with the dot head method, we look at the first 10 uh, rows. So dot head takes a number, so if I, uh, replace the uh, 10 by a 5 for example i only see the first five rows and if i want to see the first 10 rows of the excel sheet so to say i just say 10 and uh, i have to run the cell of course again and again but then uh, i see the first 10 rows and as as i already told you there are many columns in this data set and we see the last column is the sale price this is the uh, variable in us dollars that we want to predict and in order to predict this we have all the columns available that um, precede the sales price column and uh, every sale has an order number um, it has a i think it's called a placement id or something um, and then again many many features uh, over which we will go now and um, yeah so this is usually how a data science project starts you are given some raw data from some source and usually the data is missing, uh, some data is missing, uh, some da data is messy, it may not be clean, and we will, throughout the first two um, notebooks, go over um, all the features and clean them a bit and clean the data sets, and then we will create features out of them, and then only in the last uh, chapter, chapter four, we will do some uh, forecasting, some predictions. So. Um, let's go over the next couple of cells rather quickly. So um, as we see, some of the uh, columns, they have um, spelling mistakes. And uh, what we do is um, we will replace them by unified uh, text strings. So this is what these uh, code cells here do. And then uh, you will see throughout this notebook, um, there are many uh, so-called assert statements in the code where I basically assert that some condition is true for the entire data set. 
and this is how um, I uh, run quick checks to make sure that, for example, one column is never empty or one column only contains integers or data of a certain type uh, and so on. So this is what you will see to me uh, quite often. So that again, I make sure that an entire column is in the format that I expect it to be. And then uh, Pandas has some um, other um, attributes that it provides. For example, every data frame, so the variable df is now the data frame. df is the variable that uh, symbolizes um, the, the Excel data, so to say. And by saying dot shape, we get back the dimensions of the Excel sheet. So the Excel sheet has 2930 rows and 80 columns. And we will um, remove some of the rows uh, because some of the data is not clean. And we will create many, many more uh, columns as well uh, because some of the columns, they are not really useful for making predictions. So we will create um, new uh, columns out of existing columns that are more useful for making predictions. The 80 columns that we have here, they can be grouped into four different groups by the generic type, so to say. So we have uh, one of these types is called what I call continuous variables. So these are numeric values that, are, that come on a continuous scale. Then of course there are discrete variables as well um, where you, know, you have one, two, three, four or five uh, rooms in a house. So this would be a discrete column. Uh, but here first we look at the continuous uh, variables. And what we do here is we uh, assert with some quick test that the data are really continuous. So these are, these are all the columns that hold a continuous data, continuous numerical data. For example, the, um, the, the number of square foot of the first floor in a house, the number of square foot um, of uh, the second floor in a house, and so on. Here we have the description as well. And then we have many, many more like the, gar the garage area, the cross living area, and so on, the lot uh, area. So these are all uh, different measurements, but they all uh, come as continuous numbers. And if we look at um, the first five um, of only the continuous variables, so continuous variables here is one of the helper um, variables that are defined. So whenever I just write continuous variables, this is what I imported from the utils module. This is basically a shortcut uh, for all the um, names that we have here. So I don't have to specify them. This is why, why we use the utils. And here we have uh, all the um, continuous data. Uh, in the data set, for example, we see that most of them is really uh, continuous. So we see that the square feet, they can come basically in any number. It's always an integer value here, but uh, it's basically um, a good approximation of a continuous number uh, because we don't have, we have many different um, realizations of this value. This is what makes it continuous. Then we can look at some basic statistics maybe. So what we see here is most of the continuous columns um, are not null. That means they, they are not missing. But then for one column, which is called the lot frontage, we only have uh, 2,400 available da um, data points. So there is a lot of uh, data missing. And we will see um, how to deal with these missing data uh, in, a, in a bit. So um, yeah, we keep here track of, of variables that we uh, want to take a look at later on. We do the same uh, type of first check on the discrete uh, variables. So let's uh, quickly go over them as well. So these are discrete uh, columns. So for example, the number of bedrooms, that, that would be a discrete variable, the number of basements, uh, or you know, do that, or basically does uh, the, the house have a basement or not? This is a yes or no question, basically. Um, how many garage, uh, garages do I have? How many uh, cars can I put there? And so on. Let's look at all the discrete variables here. So we can already tell these are typical discrete um, variables. We see also the year here. So for the year, this is basically the one uh, variable that is close to continuous. We could basically argue it's continuous, but um, the year in which a house was built or, or sold is to me more of a discrete uh, variable. So um, the reason why I do these checks is because those different uh, groups of variables, um, they um, allow us to do different things with them. And that's why we look at these groups independently. Another group that we have is uh, nominal uh, data. So for example, if we look at some of the columns that contain uh, nominal columns, um, for example, um, these are uh, fields that um, are used as tags, so basically, um, a tag could be um, the house is of this and this style. So this would be a word describing the house and so on. The neighborhood is what I already told uh, you about in the map that we saw. 
Um, this is basically just the name of uh, the local neighborhood within Ames, Iowa. And uh, the street name, for example, would be a nominal feature and the others as well here. And we will look at all the features in detail uh, throughout this video. So here uh, is basically a brief view of the nominal uh, variables here. And we can indeed verify these are nominal uh, features. And if we look at the, the statistics here, here we have a more, um, a more full picture. So there's only one column that has some missing data, obviously. All the other columns, um, they are basically always uh, full. And then the fourth category is a category of variables that is uh, related to nominal. This is what we would call ordinal variables. So the difference between nominal variables and ordinal variables is for ordinal variables, you, can, you also have like words describing um, uh, a feature but these words can be brought into a natural order. So uh, for neighborhood or street name, there is no order. But if we look here um, at, a certain, um, at certain uh, features that are ordinal, uh, let's look at an example maybe. Um, yeah, maybe uh, there's, these are usually uh, features that uh, describe the quality of something. So uh, how good of a shape is something in? For example, um, what is the fireplace quality and so on. So how big is it or is it new, is it old and stuff like that. And these are all abbreviations um, that uh, the authors of the data set used. And uh, if you uh, want to look up what these abbreviations mean, the uh, source where we got the original CSV file from, they also contain uh, a text file where every column is described. And uh, so uh, this is where you would uh, also um, uh, read about all the uh, ordinal characteristics here. But we will change the ordinal uh, variables soon. So let's first um, look at a visualization. So oftentimes uh, when we do data science, uh, looking at data in an Excel-based format like this is already quite insightful. But visualizations are usually a lot better uh, to quickly get an overview of the data. So uh, in Python, there is a, a third-party library which is called missing and all. And this is a, a library that helps us to visualize uh, where in a data set data is missing. So what we do here is um, I plot a so-called missing matrix um, of the four categories separately. So what this does is it gives us back a matrix form, a matrix visualization where we have all the individual columns and we have white areas wherever in a row data is missing. So we see there is one column called the lot frontage, which we already identified above, which has a lots of missing, uh, missing data. And then we have the, this other column here called mass uh, VNR area, whatever this is. And this only has two missing data points. And all the other, um, all the other rows basically always have something filled in. So this could still be messy data or dirty data, but at least uh, the other uh, rows, um, the other house uh, or sales uh, basically have all the data available. So uh, this is uh, um, important to know um, what uh, to decide, what do we do with this column? So uh, my recommendation here would be to, to keep things easy, to just uh, get rid of this column because uh, then we don't have to deal with missing values. Here for this column, uh, we could try to extrapolate the missing values, but again, because it's not that many, the probably easier way to, to go about this is to just drop the rows um, and only keep rows that have um, data available for all, um, for all the, the columns. And now let's, let's qu look quickly at the visualization of uh, the other uh, three groups. So we see uh, for the uh, discrete variables, we see a similar picture. Um, we see that for the uh, column garage year build, so um, we don't have as data here available for all the houses. So that means um, in most of the cases, I would guess um, that the garage is built together with the house in the same year, obviously, but sometimes a garage could have been added later on to a house. So, and maybe sometimes this data um, is missing. So what do we do with this data? Well, I think the, the year in which a garage was built is not that important. You know, the more important thing for a house price would be, uh, does the property have a garage at all? Um, this is probably a more important uh, property than when was the garage built? So we could, basically also drop this uh, column. And then the other two categories of variables uh, indicate that we have basically 
um, almost no uh, data points missing. We see that sometimes when data points are missing, it um, occurs at different rows. So uh, probably we have what we saw here, around about seven or eight rows that um, we could uh, basically just remove because uh, they always have one missing value for, for some column. And uh, this is basically what we will do. So um, this is what we do here. We, uh, in the cleansing part here, we get rid of the two or three columns that had, or two columns it was, that had lots of missing data. So these columns are eliminated entirely. And for the rows where we, um, so here missing a lot, these are these two uh, columns here. So these are the remaining uh, columns here, we keep them. And then we basically go over the, we, have, we build a for loop here that goes over the entire, um, over the entire data set and uh, cast them as a, as a data type int or float, just to make sure that in the column, we, when it says we have a discrete number that it cannot be a floating point number in there. So this is typical cleaning work here. And then at the end, what we do is we quickly uh, print out the shape again. So we dropped two columns and we dropped a couple of uh, rows here. But again, this will save us lots of work uh, to extrapolate some, some data. And then what we do is we store them as a data, dot, uh, data underscore clean dot CSV. And uh, this would now overwrite what we already had in the data uh, folder. So in the data folder contains all the data for all the notebooks already hard coded into it basically. Uh, but if the data weren't available, this script uh, number one would up here uh, go out to the original source, get a data set, and at the end uh, store a clean CSV file. That's basically the entire idea of this first uh, Jupyter Notebook here. So now that we have a clean data set, what do we do with it? So what we do in the second notebook here is uh, after some housekeeping, which is uh, basically now self-explanatory, uh, we load now the clean data set with some helper functions. So these are all the helper functions again that come from the utils module in Python here that we, that we provided. And then we start with the um, now already cleaner uh, data. And uh, let's look at some features. This is a common mistake people make. So um, let's uh, look at maybe the numeric variables here. We have uh, sometimes um, square foot of something. So for example, the square feet of the entire house. Uh, where is it? Um, I think, yeah, here we have the lot area. This is the entire uh, in square feet measured, the entire area of the house. But then we have a garage area. And then we have uh, some uh, basement area and some first floor area and so on. And the important thing is uh, the individual uh, square feet, they add up together to the total basically. And so what that means is, from a mathematical point of view, is that there are uh, linear combinations of columns that add up perfectly to some other column. And whenever we do, for example, linear regression, we don't really want this. We want the columns to be linearly independent. So what I do here is, uh, what I check here is, um, with a quick, some quick assert statements here is, I check that uh, some um, some of the columns, they are basically perfectly the sum of some of a combination of some other columns. Here, for example, the square fit we did, but also for the basement and so on. And then what we could do is, we could uh, basically get rid of some of the uh, columns here because um, if two columns add up to the add up to some other number as well, in any linear regression, for example, later on, um, the linear this will only rec uh, confuse the linear regression um, because the linear regression may for some um, for some rows take some of the uh, one column and then for some rows some other column. In other words, what I'm saying is the constant, uh, the, the constant beta that gets estimated in, in the case of a linear regression, for example, that may be a very unstable um, um, estimator. So it's always helpful to get rid of redundant columns. And this is what we do here. And um, yeah, so this is what happens here. Then another a typical um, transformation that we will do, and this is what uh, some of you may know from um, finance data, when we want to predict, for example, prices or in, some, in, in any kind of uh, financial model, what often is done is we don't take the difference of two prices or the prices as a whole, but we, tra we take the log of some, uh, of some column or of some value. And this is in a more general setting called a so-called box Cox transformation. 
So, and as, again, as I said, the easiest one would be to just take the log, a natural logarithm um, of some number. But what we do here is we use some um, estimation technique um, that is um, a standard way of how to, uh, of to estimate the best of such transformations for individual columns. And uh, if you want to understand this in detail, um, you can read through this uh, in detail a bit more. But uh, what we will do here is I will just run this. And then basically um, what this code here does is it goes over all the columns and it only takes um, for the uh, continuous columns um, those that uh, have um, non-negative numbers because if you do a, a logarithmic transformation it only works for positive numbers obviously. And then it tries to estimate what would be the best so-called lambda here. And um, when a lambda of zero basically implies we just take the natural log of something. So in other words, what this model suggests is uh, for the um, cross living area and the first floor area, we should just take a log transformation. And for the total sales price here, uh, it also suggests that um, a probably a normal log transformation would be the best. So what we do here is um, we for all of the, all of these columns we keep of course the raw columns as they are but we add second columns um, that are the transformation so for example here at the end we have the sales price uh, the original sales price and then next to it we have the, the box cox zero transformation which is basically the natural logarithm of the value here and then what we will do later on when we do the house price predictions we will train prediction models both for the raw value um, of, the, of the sales price, but also for the transformation. And then we will check uh, which of the transformations um, works better or which of the prediction is better. And uh, because sometimes um, the prediction may work better for the actual data, but sometimes it is better to uh, fit a model on some um, transform and transformed data. And we will um, basically look at both cases and compare what is better. And then what I did here next is um, I created a section called correlations, and I defined that uh, a number uh, that uh, a number that is correlated between a correlation coefficient of 0 0.66 and uh, one is what I consider strongly correlated. If it's um, uh, if, a, if, a, if two variables are correlated between uh, a coefficient of uh, 0 0.33 and 0 0.66 then uh, I call it weakly uh, correlated. And if, it's, um, if the correlation coefficient is below 0 0.1, I call it uncorrelated. And uh, what we do here is um, I define a helper function that will plot uh, the correlation coefficient in, because plotting, as we learned, is often uh, an easier way to look at data. And then we will uh, calculate two different kinds of, um, of uh, correlations. So the first one is the classical Pearson correlation. So what we do is we create a um, correlation matrix in a visual form, and the, the indication is um, the, the more solid the color is, the more um, the heavier the correlation is, the stronger the correlation is. But uh, we don't really care if the correlation is positive or negative. All we care about um, in data science is if we find strong correlation in absolute value. Uh, because at the end of the day, the, the sign of, of, um, you know, of a feature, if it's negative one or plus one, we don't really care so much, but we care more about um, how one feature varies with an when another feature varies. In particular, we, we are interested in pairwise correlations between the sales price and some other features. And this already gives us a first uh, graphical implication of uh, which of the um, features uh, may be worthwhile to dig deeper into and which one not. So uh, a color close to white basically suggests here that a feature has no correlation uh, to the sales price here and therefore um, yeah, may not be really helpful to, to keep it in, in the data set. And uh, then we do the same thing. So what we do here is um, I sort um, the features um, according to the uh, rules that I de defined above into weakly, strongly uh, correlated and uncorrelated. And what I will do with that is later on, and we have a name error, the weak is not defined, so I should, uh, of course, um, run all the cells. So this is a common mistake people make in Jupyter Labs. They just uh, skip, a no skip a code cell. So um, what we do here is, I calculate all over again, usually this works. And then what we do here is 
we create uh, three different sets in Python that only keep um, the features that uh, are either weakly, either strongly or uncorrelated with the sales data. And why I do that here is because in, the, in chapter four, when we talk about prediction, I will not only contrast the effect of uh, taking the logarithm, for example, of the price and not taking it, but I will also uh, contrast models that uh, are allowed to work with all the features and also only to look at features that have some correlation that I ident identified before. And uh, what we try to analyze here is we try to find out if it's worthwhile for me as the statistician to um, look at this manually here basically and define uh, such uh, thresholds, uh, strong, weak and uncorrelated in a manual way. This is just an assumption here, so to say. And uh, basically pick my features manually which I think are good predictors uh, for the sales price. And then what we will see is that it's actually not a good way to do. So I can already give you the result here, but we will see that in more detail later in, in chapter four. And then again, here we have some code that basically uh, shows us in a list uh, which are the features that are totally uncorrelated to the price. So for example, the pool area is uncorrelated. That means um, if a pool is at the house or not, influences the price, but how big the pool is does not have to have does not seem to have any influence on the on the total price. In contrast, a strongly correlated uh, variable would be the cross living area. And this is of course this makes sense because uh, usually when we buy and sell uh, houses and uh, property, um, usually we have some uh, factor um, and then we multiply this by the by the size of the house or by the, the number of uh, square um, or living area and uh, then we get to the actual price. So this is how calculations, how price calculations are done by, uh, by real estate agents. And this, this is why it's not surprising that uh, the cross living area is strongly correlated to the house price. And then we have a lot of uh, what I call weakly correlated fields. So um, how big the first floor is, um, of course, is also quite uh, correlated to how big uh, the overall houses and the bigger the house, the, the more it will cost eventually. And um, yeah, so and then we do the same with the so-called Spearman um, correlation. Spearman is just a variant where we don't look at the um, or where we basically look at the or or order of uh, features. So uh, the, um, the Spearman correlation index uh, calculates the, the correlation based on the fact um, of how ordinal uh, values correlate to each other and uh, usually uh, you can take uh, you should just go ahead and uh, work with both the Spearman and the Pearson correlation index and see what works better um, even though the Spearman is of course optimized for ordinal uh, kind of data and then we do the same analysis as we did for Pearson we do for for a Spearman as well and we will see um, a similar result however now we see um, that for example also uh, in the strongly correlated uh, um, um, section, for example, the number of garage uh, is now also strongly correlated. So this is again the kitchen quality. So um, this basically now enables us to also look at, at two ordinal uh, variables um, and in terms of their correlation to the, to the sale price at the end. Then we save the data here and um, we haven't um, we haven't really uh, removed anything, but we created some new uh, columns here. So it, the, the log transformations, and of course, uh, we store these log transformations in the CSV file um, as well here. So, so far, we haven't done anything fancy. We have basically done what um, we would consider the dirty work. So the data cleaning is the dirty work because this is usually what uh, you would spend most of your time with. And then the pairwise correlations is something that uh, I would always recommend you to look at um, in the beginning so that um, you don't only understand the individual data, the, the clean data set, but also what are some rough correlations that you can already identify so that you have an idea of what are the features where you have to spend more time on and what are the features where it doesn't really make sense to spend too much time on. And uh, now we go into the next chapter, chapter three. Um, I call it descriptive visualizations because this is um, um, a chapter where this is basically all about uh, plotting. So we will plot lots of graphs and look at uh, individual features. And uh, then we will basically briefly discuss um, how good is a feature to be used in, um, in the actual forecasting model uh, later on. 
So again, we do some housekeeping and um, then we load our cleaned and transformed data. I always also keep a uh, dot head in the beginning of my notebook so that I always see that um, when I go over the notebook later on, then I see that this is the data I'm working with in this notebook. And um, so this is, makes it nicer to read. And uh, we keep a list called new variables here that will keep track of all the new features we will create. So in this uh, um, notebook, we will not only look at visualizations of features, but we will also create new features out of existing features and um, to, uh, to yeah, we, this is called feature generation. And this is also a very important process because sometimes um, you see some pattern in the data that is not for not easy to predict or not easy to learn about from by a machine learning algorithm and so you have to prepare the data set a little bit and um, create new features out of existing ones to make it easier for the machine learning model later on to um, learn something out of it so um, at first what we do is we uh, create some derived uh, variables so for example we have a variable that is called second floor square feet now I thought that the how big how big would um, the second floor be? Well, usually the second floor is very much the same size as the first floor because the second floor usually is built on top of the of the first floor. So I figure that the the size, for example, of the second floor itself is not really uh, a, a strong um, uh, feature to for prediction. However. Um, if I um, create a feature which is called has second floor, a yes or no feature, which basically just indicates if the, a second floor is available or not, then this may uh, be a, um, a stronger feature because uh, someone that looks for a house may pay a premium, for example, if there is a second floor or maybe not. So we don't know yet what the structure of the house price is, but um, building a yes or no or, or for example the second feature here has basement well the total size of a basement is usually not so important as the fact if a, if a, if a basement is there or not so uh, or the same is a fireplace so we don't really care if a house has one or two fireplaces we only care if it has at least one so this is what we do here we create new variables here which uh, are binary and uh, we will add them to our new variables list here and um, I will also always include a brief preview um, on the data set on the new feature so we see how the new features look like. And again, this would be a zero or one feature. So either a place has a fireplace or not, or either it has a garage or not, um, but there is no other value possible. Now, if we look at uh, second floor data, so what we do here is now I create some uh, pairwise plots. So we have the sales price on the Y axis and on the x-axis we have the cross living area and we see that uh, the bigger a house is the more living space there is the more expensive it is this is why the cloud uh, of data points goes from the lower left hand corner to the upper right hand corner and if we are using uh, the color here the color scheme here uh, indicate um, if uh, the house has a second floor or not what we see is Given, uh, a, a, given a fixed um, area, if a house has a second floor, it, has a, it basically comes at a discount. So in other words, people in Ames, Iowa seem to value or seem to be uh, willing to pay a premium if um, for a given size of a house, if the house is only one floor in, in, in contrast to a second floor. So in other words, people in Iowa or people in Ames here, they don't really like a second floor. It seems like it. They, at least they're not paying a premium here. So this is an interesting, um, an interesting uh, realization here. Let's look at basements. So if you look at basements, what we see here is if a house has no basement, it will get a discount. But we also see that there are not really many houses that have no basement. So in other words, even though in the United States, uh, in general, it is very rare for houses to have a basement, in Ames, Iowa, the vast majority of houses has a basement and therefore uh, having a basement is really not a good indication of uh, if a price is going to be higher or not because basically every house has a, has a basement. Unless the very few houses that don't have a basement, they come at a discount. So um, it, it seems what we deduce from this picture here is, we, we, we could say that people in Iowa, they want their house to have a basement. They're not willing to, to pay for it, not, not, not willing to pay a premium for it, but they want their house to have a, a basement. Let's look at fireplaces. 
So what we see here is given, uh, uh, so first what we see is um, there seems to be a relationship between the, um, the fact that um, you know a house has to be rather big in order to have a fireplace. This makes sense. So if you have like a bigger, let's say a luxury house maybe, then there is a, an, an increased chance uh, that this house also has a fireplace and small houses um, which are down, which are on the left here, they uh, tend to not have a fireplace. And then if a house has a fireplace, then uh, the price uh, seems to increase. So given the same uh, area, the same living area, um, having a fireplace um, yields a premium. And this makes sense because we could see that the, the fireplace, we could treat it as an indicator variable for it's a luxury house, so to say, and then for a luxury house, um, you are willing to, or you have to pay a premium to get it. So these are uh, some ways of how to, of to show some stuff here. Um, garages, garages here. Uh, we see um, if a house has no garage, uh, it comes, it, it gets a discount. Uh, other than that, we don't really see any, any pattern here. So uh, um, beyond a certain price point, every house has a garage here. So it seems that, so what we can tell from these variables here, there is different, so variables will take a different role in, um, in the uh, in the prediction model later on. So some of the variables, they only uh, seem to make sense when taken together with some other variable. So um, only for a, uh, for example, for a cheap house, it makes sense to look at uh, the garage or not uh, variable at all. So um, this is how we see that there are, there may be some complex underlying relationships between um, different sets of, of variables here. Uh, but it's still good to to get an idea, uh, at least visualize uh, it, and so that we see that what is going on here. Um, if we look at pools, what we see here is basically we um, the the variable here is quite uninteresting. Why? Because most of the houses don't have a pool, so having a pool, uh, you know, um, the 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 rare dots, the rare orange dots here, they are all over the place. So um, if we if we have a pool, we cannot really say anything about the house yet. So that's interesting because um, I would have guessed, um, without looking at the visualization, that um, a house that has a pool must be a luxury house and therefore have a higher price. But it seems like this variable is really uh, worthless because we don't have lots of data on it and not too many houses have a pool. So fireplaces uh, seems to be really a really a better indicator for luxury in Ames, Iowa. And this may be different in other places in the United States. Let's look at porches. Uh, porches seem to have a different effect than a garage. So if a house has no porch, um, then it uh, comes at a discount other than that um, it's uh, also, you know, not a really good variable because most ha most houses do have a porch, so it's uh, a variable that it's it may ver be very hard to learn from it. Then let's look at neighborhoods, and here I quote the paper that I originally um, uh, uh, showed you, and they say um, the instructors basically say that. Um, uh, they, they found that the neighborhood plays a very large role. And this is, of course, not surprising because um, also due to the history uh, of redlining in, in the United States, you have poor neighborhoods and you have rich neighborhoods. So the neighborhood where the house is in is probably the, the most uh, important indicator of a house price at all. So let's visualize it. And a good way to visualize this would be uh, to use box plots. So we have the different neighborhoods on the x-axis here. And then we have uh, the different neighborhoods in different colors. And we see that for every neighborhood, uh, we have an average or a median, I guess it is. And we have the entire span. Of course, we have outliers as well. So box uh, plots, they are usually, um, so the boxes here, they usually disregard the outliers. But then they show you here, the, usually this is the 95% of the houses where they lie. And uh, so we see that uh, there are huge differences, not only between the average, but also in terms of the spread. Um, and um, and so on uh, when it comes to house prices versus neighborhoods. So what we do here is the, the variable house prices so far is a nominal variable. So it can have uh, up to, I think, 28 different um, realizations, but um, we cannot really learn anything from a text uh, column. So what we do here in the next, um, in the next code cell, we use the pandas get dummies uh, um, method to translate the neighborhood feature, the, the nominal uh, neighborhood feature, into a so-called factor variable. So what this means is 
at the end we get 28 columns that basically uh, are a yes or no answer to the question is the house in this neighborhood yes or no so it's a 28 binary variables and we can check that uh, we did the right thing uh, by checking if there's only one one in every row because uh, a house can only be in one um, in one neighborhood of course and um, so we see here that our um, feature matrix later on will you know will grow tremendously to the right or in in its width because many of the nominal features that we have have to be translated into these uh, dummy indicator variables here as well and this is what we do it this is how we do it in python uh, using pandas.getdummies let's look at the nominal features without the neighborhood now um, let's look how um, alleys play a role so we have um, an alley in the United States is a small road or a small street that is behind the house and usually uh, when they do trash collection they usually go on the back side of the house. Um, this is quite uh, different to how this is done in Europe and we see that uh, not every house has this so, um, um, so in other words what we see here is the, uh, the absence or, and also what we see here is um, we see the the, all the blue dots here, they are actually called NA for not available. So we don't have lots of information on that. And this is also something that is interesting. So when I go back to the data cleaning part, um, what we did is we deleted all the rows that did not have all the entries filled in. However, now what we see here is um, even that doesn't mean that there are no missing data because as we see here um, in the category uh, called LA, there is the most common value in there is just called not available. So uh, we have to be careful here, even though in uh, so physically the data point is not empty, it is really empty, it's practically empty. And because of that, what we do here is we delete the column because it's, re it's really not helpful if, if the feature is missing for the majority of the data set. Then let's look at the feature called the building type. So there are different types of buildings uh, in Ames. So there's the most common one is the one family home called one fam. And then we have two different kinds of uh, townhouses in uh, orange and green. And then we have a duplex, um, which is down here. And we have a two family condo, which is also rare, but it's also down here. So we see that the type of a house does play a role. Um, so um, what we see here, uh, is to make the feature uh, maybe a little bit better to, to work with is we go ahead and we merge the two townhouses into one category so green and uh, orange here which is about the same so it seems to be um, um, the, 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 the orange ones they are like a slightly bigger uh, townhouses and the green ones are slightly smaller townhouses but the, the townhouse itself they are around about here so we have a different slope here in the data cloud if you only look at, at uh, townhouses and the slope is here rather constant here so what we do is we lump those two groups together into one to get a stronger signal uh, later on and we also do that for the two family condo and duplex which are both down here because what we see here if we look at the violet and the red dots here they are mostly down here so it makes sense to lump them together because the two types of houses they really seem to be one so in terms of pricing and um, so this is also something that um, you should uh, you something that requires manual work here uh, a computer wouldn't see that these two categories basically are the same but uh, what we have here is basically as as people uh, when we categorize it uh, statistically um, we make up some categories but uh, we and in this case we make up two categories where we should have statistically speaking only made up one category name for it so this is basically a way of uh, cleaning uh, up what the statist statistician uh, came up with and then of course we have to create dummy variables again so here we get uh, one zero variables again and uh, because that's on the only thing we can work with here let's look at air conditioning so what we see here is uh, if a house has no air condition it comes at a discount so this seems to be a variable that is a very um, important variable and now here again this is a nominal variable which only has two labels that, uh, or, two, or two realizations that it comes in which is y for yes and n for no so really is this a nominal data a data type no not really this is really a binary uh, data type so um, just because the data in the raw format is provided to us as a text string which only contains yeses and nos y and n's uh, 
uh, we have to uh, really uh, get um, some um, more meaning out of it by casting it as a correct data type, which in this case obviously is again um, a one or zero here. And so we have we end up with one column, which is called air conditioning, and it has a one if we have air conditioning. And then we have uh, a category that is uh, called proximity to, to various conditions. And this is really uh, a very messy column, or very uh, two messy columns actually. So we have two, con uh, two columns called condition one and condition two. And they, uh, they are basically columns that con contain tags. That's basically the best way to describe it. And um, so when we look at it, let's maybe look at what are the, the most commonly used tags. So, uh, the abbreviation feeder is basically one of the um, one of the um, realizations that comes up quite often. And what a feeder is, this is basically this basically means the house is uh, close to a feeder street, and a feeder street is a street that um, basically brings uh, cars to the next highway, so to say. So um, basically, what I'm saying is, um, if a house is next to such a street, this may ha have a bad influence on the price because no one wants to live. Uh, close to a big street at the end of the day and then uh, there are some uh, categories called rr something and these are always these are uh, different categories uh, regarding railroads um, and you can look them up what they mean re in uh, what they me mean in particular but what we do here is we will go ahead and we will basically lump all the different railroad categories together into one a new category which is called near railroad yes or no so this is kind of the, the transforming that needs to be done so that, uh, that we can actually um, use these labels here. And um, yeah, let's look at um, what this means here. We have a visualization. So as I said, if you live close to a feeder street, you get a discount, right? And so uh, what we uh, use, what we do here is um, in this next code here, I, um, I create a new variable called street, I create a new variable called railroad, and then there's also a one called park. So if you're neck close to some, uh, some park, uh, there are several ways of saying that in the data set, and we only make it one unified way of saying that, and we will lump together all the different park categories also into one big category just called park. And now if I run this, this will also create some plots, and we see that the different categories that we have um, they ha they result in different slopes in the data set in the data cloud so they they will have a different um, effect so this is a very easy way to plot called a library called uh, matplotlib or seaborn this is what it does is it's a so-called lm plot and an lm plot is basically a linear regression model without doing the regression but it's basically a simple linear model and we see different scopes here uh, different slopes here and uh, this is what we what we are looking for as data scientists. We want to see uh, different correlations, how strong uh, is something correlated with one another, and also, of course, the slopes, which is kind of a, a, a different way of saying uh, something is correlated or not. So here we create the, the categories I, I talked about, and then we finally delete the condition uh, columns because the text uh, conditions, they don't really help us in any prediction. And uh, so, these are the new uh, features we created here. Let's look quickly at some other, um, some other feature called the exterior. This is also a tag, a tag-like uh, feature. So this is basically uh, a feature that um, lumps together in two, uh, in two um, columns the two most commonly used materials out of which the house is built. And we can see that there is some pattern in it, right? So some houses are, are built uh, of materials that are more pricey and some are built of uh, cheaper um, materials. So what we will do is we will um, uh, look at this, but then what I found here is the, the category is too diverse, so uh, we couldn't really uh, use this um, to make any good prediction. So this is, uh, I'm already taking uh, ahead the result that we will see, but uh, of course I played with the data um, a lot more. And um, I, I found that um, the material out of which the house is done, you know, in theory it may have an impact, but in practicality, uh, practicality for our models, we didn't really see much of a difference. So we uh, delete the, the, the column here. And um, then there are some other uh, categories, some other features, some called the foundation. And here we see some strong pattern. 
So depending on uh, how the house is founded, um, this may that this basically seems to indicate a price uh, discount or a price premium, uh, depending on how you look at it. So what we do here is we get dummy variables as well uh, for the different foundation types um, and what they are in detail. Uh, let's not get into too much detail here. You could read it up. But again, uh, we only take these variables here because we can really measure a linear relationship and we can see different slopes. So it really makes sense to keep them here in a clean way, in a one or zero way. Um, then we look at some other features that are not so relevant. We, let's, we look here at the uh, feature called a garage type. And uh, so this talks about is the garage um, built next to the house or a little bit away, further away from the house? Uh, is it a carport or real garage and, and so on? And uh, what I found here is that this really didn't um, play too much of a, a role here. So what we'll do here is we'll just delete this as well. Uh, it's more important if a house has a garage or not. It's not important what kind of a garage it has. If we look at heating, heating, um, we see here different data dots. Um, most of the um, houses have a gas heating. So um, if there is another heating, uh, gas water and so on, uh, gas W, whatever this is, uh, we see there's not too much variation in here. So this is also not a good feature to learn from. So we, we get rid of the feature as well. Let's look at house style. Um, so here we see, think that we see a pattern, but again, the slopes are not too much different uh, here. And um, I, I worked with it uh, again, and I found also that this feature, the, the house uh, type is not so important. So here it says, is it a one story house or a two story house? Well, we also have uh, another feature called has second floor up there already, which we're using. So the house style, if it's a one story or a two story, so the house style is a text field first and foremost. So uh, this is not so important because we already have other variables that basically indicate the same kind, kind of information, information and the slopes here are not too different. So this is why we get rid of this feature here as well. Land contour, um, we see there is some sort of a pattern here, but this is really not too, man too many data points here. And um, so we, we got rid of this as well. And uh, there are some more. So lot configuration, if we look, the, uh, look at this, we see there's, uh, yeah, it's, not, it's a little bit messy here, not too much con uh, too variation here. So we also don't look at this. And you see that uh, in general, um, I get rid of many, many of these fields because at the end of the day, uh, what these are, these are fields that either um, are already um, included via another field already that we have, or they are just too messy and we cannot really deal with it. And you cannot just uh, take any text field and leave it in a data set and put, give it the, to the prediction algorithm later on, because um, the feature has to be made a one zero um, a dummy um, kind of uh, column first. And sometimes this is too hard to do. And at the end of the day, if you have too many one or zero columns, then uh, what we will uh, have, we have another problem, which is called the curse of dimensionality. So we also don't want to run into this. So it, uh, we also have to find a balance of not creating too many uh, variables later on. This is why uh, I'm um, removing many of the variables here. And also mis miscellaneous. This is basically a column that you will find in any data set of any sort, something called other or mis misc or mis miscellaneous and so on. And usually, as we look at this data cloud here, doesn't, it's not really helpful here. Let's look at uh, the roofs. Roofs, uh, as we see, there are different kinds of roofs, but um, most of the houses in, in Ames have the same kind of roof here. So again, this is also a field that is not really helpful. And uh, so we uh, get rid of it as well. And now we come to some more interesting fields. So there's one text field called sale info. And this basically covers abnormal uh, sales. So in other words, foreclosures. So someone, some person goes bankrupt and then the house is foreclosed. So the bank takes away the house. And what this basically does is, this basically um, does not enable a fast or a, a real uh, sell process, but it, it, it goes into a very rapid sell process. So we can expect that the house price will be at a discount here. So let's look at this. So at first, what categories are there? There is a normal sell, sale, then we have a partial sale, and we have the abnormal sale. And again, abnormal means a, a bank foreclosure. So let's look at uh, a data plot here and we see the foreclosures, they all come at a discount. 
So uh, if a house was um, basically auctioned away by a bank or not, this is a very important detail here uh, when we want to predict house prices. And for partial sales, um, this uh, seems to be um, where uh, someone has a house and is basically only selling some part of the house, some uh, you know unit within the house, and this seems to come at a premium here. So we keep um, we keep uh, features um, out of that. We have here a line plot again that we see that especially partial and uh, where is it abnormal? They have they result in different slopes. So this basically indicates that we should keep him and that we should keep the variables in a clean way. So what we'll do here is we will create a clean uh, one or zero variables here again uh, and three new features, partial sale, abnormal sale and new home. New home is a feature uh, if a house was sold for the first time or a second time. And when, whenever a house is sold for the first time, it also comes at a, a light premium here. Street names uh, as a feature are not valuable at all. So we saw that neighborhood is important, but uh, we could argue that a street name or the street in which the houses is kind of um, related to the neighborhood in which the houses, but it's too, too granular. So um, we have uh, probably too many different streets. And then we would again run into the, in the, into the curse of dimensionality where we end up with too many one or zero variables for every street basically. And uh, this will not be helpful in the prediction later on. Some more interesting features we can uh, develop is the, the age of a house. So in the data set, if you look closely, you will see that we have uh, columns called year remodeled and year built. And then we have um, basically um, year sold or year sale. We also have a variable. And the idea is that um, while it is important when the, the, when the uh, house was sold because of inflation, so if a house was um, sold in 1980 and, not, and another one was sold in 1990 and the next one was sold in the year 2000, then we would expect that the price of the houses is going to uh, increase due to natural inflation. However, this is not what we are looking at here. We're looking here at how old the house is. So we're looking at the difference of uh, when, this, when the sale was done and when the house was built. And this variable does not exist. So there is no variable called age. So what we do is we just create it. And we also do this a similar variable for remodel. So whenever a house gets very old, then usually what happens, it's remodeled by some uh, construction company. And then it is sold again. Um, and then usually it gets a premium because it was modernized. And uh, this is what we uh, capture with the variable remodeled, yes or no here. And then we have uh, variables called year since built, year since remodeled. So we capture the age and the time. And we see that um, there is some variation again. So most houses are sold when they are new. And then after a house gets beyond a certain age, it is not really, uh, yeah, there are not so many left. But this is also due to the fact that uh, the city of Ames is not so old, um, I guess. So we create some one of zero variables here again and plot them again. And we see that if a house has been rebuilt, uh, built, recently built, uh, this is also, um, uh, I forgot to mention this, uh, some uh, feature variable. So instead of just looking at the years built and the years since remodeled, which is a continuous variable, we can already also create feature variables that are called recently built or recently modeled, where I uh, create a one or zero variable by uh, asking if the house was built within the last 10 years, then it's a yes. And if it's built beyond uh, 10 years ago, then we say no. So what this does is it uh, basically um, um, translate the continuous variable the age of a house or the age uh, of or the time of when the house was um, remodeled into a binary variable. And we keep this as a secondary variable because we see that maybe the variable itself uh, in terms of its being continuous does not help so much. So we take the binary variable instead as a proxy. And we will, of course, in the next chapter, um, look at um, both of that and then we will see which one works better. So. Again, uh, we get rid of some of the variables here. And then uh, lastly, before we end this chapter here, what we do here is we uh, have to take care of some outliers. Now you may wonder, why did I not take care of some outliers before? Well, now that the data is clean, uh, what we can do is we can run some automated algorithm to detect outliers. And I chose one 
um, that is called in so-called isolation forest. You can uh, do your own read up on what that what that is. Is it's basically um, 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 you know uh, a machine learning algorithm or a statistic method that um, basically looks at the entire data set and given some of the um, some parameters, it basically gets rid of some uh, of some rows that are too different from the from the cross of the rows. And this is a, a way of you know automating um, the outlier, uh, removing outlier process. We could do that manually as well. But the interesting thing is, what I did is um, I plotted the outliers, and we see all the outliers here visualized. These are houses that are extremely big, or exte extremely pricey, or uh, the opposite, so extremely small and, and, and extremely cheap, and they are removed. And the ones that uh, were removed by the authors of the paper. They are all also in, in enclosed in this set here. So in, so in other words, our automated way of removing uh, outliers detected all of the outliers that uh, the statistic people uh, from the paper also discovered and removed. And uh, I think we remove one or two more outliers due to statistical properties. And uh, then at the end, all we do is we store the now not only cleaned uh, data set, but also the data set that now contains all the features or the new features that we generated. So now we have gone a long way from uh, coming from the raw data set and do some first approximate cleaning. Then we looked at some correlations. And now in this, um, in this uh, data set, we also put in many, many, or much, much more manual work, many, many more steps. And now we have um, a new um, a new data set which is now 109 columns wide. So we started with the initial 78 columns, and we are now at uh, 109 columns. And we have um, discarded some more rows uh, again. But um, at the end of the day, we have basically transformed the data set a little bit more. And now we have a feature set that we can actually use for prediction. So again, some, as I said throughout this chapter here, some of the features, they are not uh, suitable for statistical uh, models. And now in the final step, we open chapter four, which is called predictive models. And now what we will do is we will run some of the, um, some machine learning algorithms um, on the cleaned data set and also on the not so clean data set just to, to show the, the contrast. So um, one a caveat here, um, this is not about getting the best possible result on the Ames uh, house price data set. If you want to look what is the best um, data set here, the best solution, maybe the best model to predict it, you should go to, uh, for example, the Kaggle competition page and uh, look up uh, some of the competitions there. Uh, what we do here is, uh, the, the, here the idea is to contrast uh, using the cleaned uh, data, mo uh, the, the clean data set versus the not so clean data set and also um, l showcasing uh, a different subset of variables that we manually detected in chapter two by only looking at correlations. And then we will see some, we will take some learnings from that. Okay, we import some stuff here and now um, do some housekeeping, and now we will uh, um, load the original data set, which we call data clean. So this is the data set as it was after the first uh, chapter was done here. So this is the data set that is already a little bit clean, so there is no missing data in there, for example, um, and some other stuff, but we have no transformation here. There's no Cox uh, transformation, no log transformation, no new features, nothing. And we call this data set uh, DF1 here. And um, then what we do is we um, um, encode the ordinals. There is a helper function in sklearn. sklearn is the standard um, machine learning uh, library in Python. So there is a helper method that can encode the ordinals um, automatically. This is basically automating all the work that we put in in chapter three. However, uh, I will show you that um, sklearn will do a, a much worse job than we did because um, we as people, uh, we as humans, we see that there is an underlying story, so to say, or intuition behind the nominal values. This is why we dropped some of the columns and why we uh, lumped several values into, some, into one uh, value, uh, one in one uniform value. And we did all the cleanings in chapter three and um, the automated way of scikit-learn cannot do that. So it can only basically create dummy variables, so zero or one variables out of, um, 
out of the ordinal and nominal um, characteristics. And that means we, uh, we can basically pass this data now on to the sklearn models. However, the data set is not really good. So this is really uh, the minimal transformation that is needed to make it mathematically work, but it, as we will see, it's not a really good result. So this is the data set. It contains now only numbers. All the nominal values are gone. And um, now we store it into a, um, into a matrix X, X1, and into a vector Y1, the sale price, because the, um, the names usually used in machine learning is a big feature matrix X is fitted to a target uh, vector Y. So we are, we are not using the, the pandas data frame anymore, but we are now using real matrix, uh, matrices and vectors from NumPy. Now we look at the improved data. So this uh, loads data from the uh, chapter three, from the end of chapter three. So we have the, the transformation in there and the factor variables that are created. And we will do the same type of uh, transformation here as well. And we will store that in X2. And here, because we have log transformation, we now have Y2 and Y2L for the price as, as, uh, as the log value. And then we do for comparison reason, this is what I mentioned in chapter two, we um, do one more import. We import um, basically now the variables that are strongly correlated and also the ones that are weakly correlated. And what we do is, as I uh, told you in chapter two is, where we had those uh, matrices here, those correlation matrices, um, what, we, what we could do as humans is we could drop all the features that are somewhat weakly transform, uh, correlated to the sales price and say, okay, it's not correlated strongly or not, not, not even correlated at all. So let's just drop it and uh, not look at it in the prediction. And this is basically what we do here. So we only work with the strongly and the weakly correlated um, features. So only the features that have a correlation uh, coefficient of at least 0 0.33 with the sales price. And this is something that we could have done as humans, but we, we will see, it turns out that this is actually something we shouldn't do. So this is just something to, to show you that um, you should always, the learning from this will be that you should always give the machine learning algorithms all the features you have, as long as they are clean and not try to subselect them uh, and be smarter than the machine learning algorithm. Because once you have a very clean data set, the machine learning algorithms, they are already very good at selecting um, an own feature set. So we do that again here, and we store this in the uh, variables x3 and y3 and y3 log. So now we have three data sets as matrices and vectors. And now what, what I do here in the next step, I create a helper function called cross-validation, which um, does uh, a cross-validation for uh, any kind of uh, machine learning model, I pass it. And by default, we do 10k-fold, or we do 10-fold cross-validation. And so what cross-validation is in a nutshell, is we take a data set and we split it into 10 equal parts and we take nine of them. And so we take 90% of the data and we fit a model and then we predict it on 10% that we did not use for training. And then we calculate an error measure on this 10% and then we do it for another set of nine, um, of nine um, yeah, folds. And we do that 10 times until every 10% of the data set has been in the used for prediction and used for evaluation once. And this way, uh, what we do is we um, train the model in this case 10 times and we make it, we make prediction 10 times on data the model has not yet seen before. And then we average the arrow. And this way we get an unbiased estimate of how the, um, how the model would perform in the real world on unseen data. Because the idea of the house prediction here is we want to predict uh, the house, the price of a house that we haven't seen before. And uh, then in here, we calculate different kinds of error measures. Uh, most notably for you probably would be the root mean squared error. This is what basically most of you should know. And maybe the R2 uh, error. And then we have some other called the bias and the mean absolute error and uh, the maximum deviation and so on. But we will focus on the R2 and the RMSE here or just MSE. And um, yeah, so we define the helper function. You will often see uh, this happening in some analysis where you define one or two helper functions once and then you run it all over and over again. 
And here we will have a dictionary in Python called results where we'll store all the results to so compare it at the end. And now we will run our first couple of models here. So we start with a simple linear regression as we all learn in Stats 101. So how this works in uh, sklearn is the following. We take the algorithm called linear regression, we imported this before, and we have to initialize it. This is what we do it with the call operator, and we store the model on in the variable called lm. And then inside this cross-validation function, what happens is um, we pass in the lm as the model variable here, and then somewhere in, in the, in the cross-validation, the, um, the code says model.fit, so we, we call the dot .fit uh, method on the model, and then we call the dot .predict method, and this is how, what scikit-learn basically does, and this is what makes the model fit and then uh, predict uh, on a new data set. And this is all, all automated in this function called cross-validation, okay? So let's create a new linear regression model and run it on our original data that we just barely cleaned and we didn't do any feature generation yet. And uh, now we run the, the ten fold cross-validation and we get back results. And one thing that we should already tell you that something bad happened here is that the R2 here is negative and basically negative infinity. So the R2 is usually between 0 and 1, the adjusted R2. And um, in, rare, rare, in rare circumstances, the R squared can actually be negative, and it, it's basically negative when something goes terribly wrong in the model. And this is already uh, indicating that the linear model on the on the raw data set, so to say, on, on the a little uh, on the least cleaned data set, is not really a good model. And also the um, the mean squared error, the root mean squared error, is very very high here. So uh, we shouldn't really uh, trust this model yet. However, this is the, the the easiest benchmark we may have. However, it's really a bad benchmark. And now let's use our improved data and this now works with the data with all the new features that we generated in the chap in chapter three here. So we do that for two cases, once for the normal price and then for the log scale price. So we run the linear regression and immediately we see we get an R2 of 0 0.92 and we get a way lower uh, root mean squared error than above. So that means um, with our cleaned data set, with all the time that we put in into cleaning the data set and generating new features, it's really worth it. So uh, we uh, improved the prediction by a lot here. And we have a bias that is very low, so a bias of negative $89 means that on average our model predicts a price that is on average $90 too low. And if we go back to the original bias, this was basically plus infinity, right? So. Um, we see that um, this, uh, now we understand the values, the, the measures even more. And now let's run it on the log scale as well. And on the log scale, um, what we see here, the R2 goes up and the root mean squared error goes a little bit lower. So this means, uh, and interesting what we also see is that the bias is in absolute values a little bit higher than before. So in other words, what happens is, a model that is trained on a log scale, so only the prices, the sale prices that we fit the model on, um, are put on a log scale, leads to a situation where the bias is a little bit higher. However, the overall R2 and root mean squared error, they basically improve. So by giving up a little bit of bias, we get on average a way better model. So in other words, using a log scale for prices in, the, in, the, in this house uh, data set, uh, seems to improve the situation. This does not have to be the case. Um, log transformations are often used for rate of returns, uh, most notably in finance, but it also uh, helps to improve the situation here. And now let's do um, a third scenario for the linear regression. Let's now use the improved data set. However, we only use variables that have a strong or weak co um, correlation with the sales price. So we basically drop all the, the, all the columns that have an almost white, whitish here um, color um, in terms of the uh, highlighting here, basically all the, all the um, uh, features that seem to have no correlation with the sales price. And now what happens if you run this, once for the normal scale and once for, for the log scale, is our R2 goes, uh, goes down 
and the root mean squared error goes up. So in other words, by only giving the linear regression model the strongly and the weakly correlated features and dropping all the seemingly unrelated features or uncorrelated features to use the correct word, we actually get a, a worse performance um, in the prediction. And that means, uh, in this case, we as humans cannot outsmart, so to say, the computer. Um, the computer, the already the linear regression model, is rather good, uh, is, is better than us humans in selecting features. And now how does a linear regression model fit uh, um, or select features? Well, um, basically um, a linear regression model uses better terms and um, so, um, a, and a better better value of close to zero basically means that uh, the linear regression gives no weight on a certain feature, and this is how um, this is how the linear uh, how the linear model can get rid of some um, of some feature. And also, what is important is um, the the linear regression model here. This is just a, a simple linear regression model. This is not a uh, a linear regression model with interaction terms and so on. So um, this is uh, so the linear regression. What I'm saying here is uh, could be improved by making the, the the model a little bit more complex. However, we will not do that. Um, this is again, if you want to know how this could be done, uh, check the Kaggle competition for how to uh, to win it. And uh, now what we do instead is we, we we will use another linear model, which is called the lasso. And the lasso model is a linear regression model similar to the next one also. I can already give you the name for that, which is called the rich regression. And both the lasso model and the rich regression, they have a different way of constraining the better terms um, than the normal linear regression does. So what the lasso basically does is, if a better is close to zero, it basically sets it to hard zero. So it basically, um, you know, if a value, if in order for a better to be non-zero, it has to be significantly different from the non-zero, from zero. This is what lasso and rich do at the end of the day in, you know, a rough speak, so to say. Now let's do that. And the lasso has to be calibrated. So the lasso uh, regression um, takes a parameter called alpha, and this has to be optimized. And what we do is we use um, a so-called grid search to also not only do the k-fold cross-validation, but also to optimize the alpha value. So at first, what we do is we go ahead and we do the grid search to find the best possible alpha. So at the end of the day, this is similar to how cross-validation works. And, and then we do that for different kinds of uh, alphas. And then at the end, we choose the best alpha. And um, the alphas that we use here was um, between what is it? I think we used, um, maybe let's just copy paste this here in its own cell. So copy paste. So these are all the alphas that we are looking at. And the grid search determined that the alpha of 20 uh, results uh, in the best result. And now we use the best alpha in the, in the lasso model and do the cross validation to get an unbiased estimate. And we see that um, the unbiased estimate on the O data, on the original data, is now kind of um, at least stable. So in comparison to the original uh, linear regression, the simple linear regression run on the, un, on, on the uh, barely clean data set, on the, I call it the original data set, this has resulted in a basically a negative R2 above, now resides in at least a kind of okay R2, which is 0 0.81, but it's still bad, right? It's still way worse than the linear regression for the improved data set up, the, up here. So what we learn from this is um, that um, the, the, the lesser regression, but also the rich regression, they can handle, um, they make the linear regression model more stable in a sense, but um, still, um, if we don't give the, the model a good data set um, with a good feature, with good generated features, then uh, again, we will get bad results. So let's now do the um, lasso for the improved data set. And now what we see here is, and also on the log scale, and now we see that uh, the, the um, Lasso regression has an R2 of 0 0.925, and if we go back up to the normal linear regression, we have an R2 which is a little bit higher. 
So in other words, the lasso regression here is a little bit worse for uh, the improved data set uh, given, compared to the um, normal linear uh, model. And this uh, is something that we can only find out by, um, by, by a trial and error. If we again go ahead with our manually uh, chosen features, now what happens is um, the R2 and the R become even worse. So again here, um, the, this is a general rule. Whenever we manually pre-select the features, we get worse results. So we should always give uh, the, the, the model all the data that we have, all the, all the columns that we have, and then uh, have the model make the selection and in an automated way and um, not make this on our own. Let's look at the uh, last linear model, the so-called rich regression. Also here we have a grid search. So also here we have to optimize a, a parameter called alpha. And uh, also the rich regression, uh, uh, rich, the rich regression is able to work with the totally uncleaned data set. However, the result R2 of, eight point, of 0 0.85 is also not so good. So let's uh, use our improved data set again. And now improved the data set uh, and the log scale yields a very good result here. And if I manually choose um, or pre-select some features, I get a worse result again. So this is a general rule. So as I said before, the learning is don't try to be smarter than the uh, machine learning algorithm here. Let's look at a different family of algorithms. So now we have looked at three different models that are linear. And now let's look at a tree-based model, with uh, most notably uh, the random forest. The random forest, I can already tell you, I like it very much because the random forest is a very flexible model in terms of what kind of patterns it can learn. And it's also a model that doesn't require you to clean the data set to an absolute uh, maximum. So for example, um, instead of having one or zero dummy variables, we could have a yes or no text variable and the random forest would still work. So um, of course I give it the, 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 the data set with the dummy variables here, but uh, the random forest, um, if you need a quick and dirty approach to get, to get like a first uh, indication of how good a prediction could be, you can use a, a random forest on a, um, you should always include a random forest and you don't have to really uh, generate all the features in a dummy way and uh, the random forest can still work with it. So let's look at it. The random forest has one downside and we can already see it here when I run it, it takes some time. So here we run the tenfold cross validation and the random forest regression creates 500 so-called randomized trees in the, in, within the same forest and then each tree makes a prediction and then the collective uh, is put together and to make one prediction on the overall level and training all these individual trees in the forest takes time. So uh, now, the, now this is over, but we see that the random forest on the, on the dirty data set or on the no unclean data set from chapter one already um, goes to an R2 of almost 0 0.9. So um, this is something the linear models couldn't do. The linear models could only go up to, let's say 0 0.85 in the best case scenario uh, for the uh, original data and uh, the random forest already um, is able to, de to detect some of the, the features. So uh, the learning from this is either you spend lots of time to generate features um, on your own manually, or you rely on a little bit more sophisticated algorithm like the random forest, and then you couldn't use the uh, linear model here, unfortunately, but the random forest basically spares you some of the manual work for feature generation. And now let's, run, let's have the um, random forest run on the normal scale and the log scale for our improved data set. And uh, again, now here this takes some time. So um, one way to optimize this would be to use uh, less trees. And I think uh, if we used 50 to 100 trees in the forest, we would also get already get a very similar result. Usually what you do is, um, when you work on a big data set is you start with a tree that ha uh, with a forest that has not so many trees let's say you start with 100 and then you increase the number of trees uh, and then you run the same model over and over again and until you see that um, the additional um, benefit uh, is not given anymore and then you stop growing the forest and then you use this as the number of trees in the in the forest for all the other models that you built so 
um, yeah, you have to manually optimize this parameter as well. And now let's look at what the result is. So the result is that we get a better result with our improved data set. However, um, here the normal scale is a little bit better than the log scale, but we can neglect this actually, so it's not a big of a deal. But the linear model here was even better. So um, this basically tells us the story that even though the random forest spares us to uh, do all the feature generation to the maximum, so to say, um, doing the feature generation to the max manually uh, helps us together with the linear model because the house pricing, the house prices, uh, they seem to be explainable in, in um, with linear models in a better way. So uh, to get the best result, uh, in order to make this work, we have to put in the manual work. There is no way to to not get to the best result to do the manual work. And now um, let's uh, run the last two cells here just to be complete. So this is now running the random forest with the uh, manually pre-selected features from chapter two. We're using the strong and weakly uh, correlated uh, features. And uh, we will see uh, what the output is here as well. So now here we see um, the result is not so good as compared to giving it all the features. And of course, the random forest is also very good at selecting, so to say, features. It does so implicitly. Um, and um, so again here the learning is if you have a data in a clean format just give it to the machine learning model and have the machine learning model um, select the features. And now let's look at um, the overall results from another angle. Let's look at the two most common error methods here. Let's lo first look at the root mean squared error and let's compare all the results. So um, if we look at the uh, original data set, the uncleaned data set, and only the root mean squared error, we see that um, the, the random forest is the best model. And the linear model itself doesn't really, it's, it's not stable, right? The, 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 the raw linear model doesn't work basically. And if we use a rich or lesser regression, then we can make it work. But if we don't want to process our data, if we don't want to put in the manual cleaning work and the manual feature generation work, a random forest may be the best model in terms of um, root mean squared error. If we use our, uh, if we use our improved data set, um, which is the data set that we spend so much time cleaning, then we see that we can get a way better result using a linear model now and not the random forest. However, uh, we, had to, we had to spend all the time cleaning, right? So we, we get, this is basically the improvement we, we get by um, you know, spending manual uh, work. Let's look at the uh, logarithmic transformation. This gets, gives an even better result. So in this uh, situation, the best result would probably be to um, put in the manual work, use a logarithmic transformation of the price, and then use some sort of a linear model. And again, let's look at the, uh, our pre-selected model. And our pre-selected model is uh, somewhere in between. So again, uh, let's not, once we have a data set, let's not try to be smarter than a machine learning algorithm. And now le finally, let's also compare this to the R2 um, um, error measure. So in R2, of course, we get the same uh, order for the, for the um, original data set, for the unclean data set, the random forest would be the best. Uh, and explains roughly 90% of the variation in the in the features. And if we look at the improved data set, also with the logarithmic transformation, uh, the rich regression is the best model. And if we look at the um, at the pre-selected data set, and then what we see is we are somewhere in the middle. So that's the, the big learning. So let me summarize uh, what we looked at in this case study. Uh, we looked at this case study at first of how we open a data set um, and then look at it on a very high level. So remember that I, in my mind, um, um, grouped all the individual features into these four big groups, continuous, discrete, nominal, and ordinal. This is something that you should always do because um, these you know, variables of these four types um, always uh, require different treatment later on. We did some very... Um, raw level uh, cleaning by getting rid of uh, rows that were obviously missing data and columns that were not really filled in, like here with the visualization, that was a nice help. However, then we realized that um, this is not enough. So if we go into the 
uh, into the chapter three where we did all the manual work, we saw that uh, some of the fields, for example, were not empty but had an not available here. So they were basically uh, empty, but the the Excel sheet didn't tell us it was empty. So we have to really spend manual time to to realize this and automate this. Um, the correlations I don't want to disregard here, even though they were not helpful in choosing a better uh, selection of features to make make a prediction they are always uh, still worthwhile to do in the beginning to get a rough idea of what are the features um, that should be used that could work and because if we are time constrained in a real work scenario and we cannot go over all the features and put in some manual work then maybe it is a worthwhile idea to start with all the features that have a strong correlation uh, with the sales price and put in the manual work that we did uh, to these features first and see how far, far we can go. And if we are happy with our predictions, then we just keep it. And then uh, only if we're not happy with our prediction results, uh, we would uh, then more and more include um, uh, features here that are seemingly unrela unrelated or uncorrelated to the sales price. And uh, by doing the, we can also, um, in this uh, light here, we can also, um, uh, put uh, already also explained some of the work we did in the uh, chapter three in the, the feature generation part. So what we did basically is for features that are seemingly un uncorrelated to the sales price, we discovered some pattern that the computer wouldn't uh, discover. And by uh, lumping different categories together into one or by creating one zero variables out of uh, nominal variables, for example, um, and deriving some other variables out of some existing variables already. We did some manual work that the computer these days cannot uh, yet do. And then finally, uh, we ended up with the, the basically easiest part in machine learning, which is just to run the models. So this is basically uh, the part that uh, requires the least amount of manual work. And then we learned that it does not pay any benefits to uh, try to be smarter and do some manual pre-selection. Automated uh, feature selection is the best, is the way to go. And then we saw that in this case, um, it is obviously worthwhile to use a linear model and the linear model requires clean data. So in order to get the best possible result, um, you, you have to put in the manual work here. There's no way around this. Now, what we didn't do uh, in this, um, in this case study is we did not uh, use any uh, deep learning methods. This makes sense. Why? Because in order to uh, use some neural networks and deep learning methods, you need um, a way bigger uh, data set. Um, the number of samples should be in the, at least in tens of thousands, maybe in the one hundreds of thousands. Um, and we only had roughly 2,300 uh, rows here, so uh, samples of data. So doing deep learning here doesn't make any sense. And um, so this is uh, one reason why we couldn't do that. What I would now do if I had more time and I wanted to get a better result is, I would probably try to run uh, some other um, machine learning models. In particular, um, I would try to uh, stick to linear models and try to um, get some interaction terms into it to do some, let's say, quadratic, quadratic um, uh, linear regression, something like this. This is where I would now spend some time on and um, see if I can get better results, but we're not doing this here. Okay, so uh, this is it. Um, this is the case study, so I hope you liked it. And uh, again, here is the link, github.com slash web artifacts um, slash Ames housing. Um, and this video will also be um, uh, made available. And uh, if you have any comments, uh, I would uh, also appreciate uh, to receive, uh, for example, either an issue where you could raise a question of, hey, why, why did you do it this way and couldn't this be done in a better way? Or maybe if you uh, come up with a better solution of how to solve this problem, maybe just copy or clone my project here um, and use it and make some improvements and then make a pull request to uh, basically merge in uh, your improvement to this project. Um, this would be a nice contribution. But other than that, um, yeah, I hope you liked it and I hope you learned a whole lot. So I see you soon on the channel.